This chapter looks at American public assistance policy and programming, which of course is administered with quite a different um, flavor than, than the social insurance programming that we looked at last week. There's a great deal of stigma associated with this, and while the social insurance programs uh, in our nation have something of an institutional perspective, that is, uh, if you remember, we talked about the institutional versus the re residual perspective of social welfare. Uh, if if um, the institutional perspective suggests that individuals have a right to receive the benefits that they get, and there are, there are um, certainly some some suggestions of that in the social insurance programming um, in in America. However the public assistance programming really kind of tends towards the other extreme, the residual perspective, which suggests that, you know, if you're going to get these benefits, you get them for the shortest amount of time possible and in the least amount possible in order to get by. So there's quite a bit of difference in flavor, let's say, as far as how these programs are administered. Now, as as we've talked about already, you know, other, other nations around the world, particularly the European nations, have a more uh, integrated plan for public assistance. But we have this patchwork quilt of policies and programs. Some of them are public. Some of them are not. Some of them are for-profit. Some of them are non-profit, um, et cetera, et cetera, so that, that uh, our, our uh, delivery of social services in the United States is, is very much a patchwork. And this is particularly true also for public assistance. While these these programs are, for the largest part, administered by governmental agencies, public agencies, nonetheless, uh, it is still very uncoordinated, partly because of the fact that uh, in the, the uh, Reagan era, the administration of public assistance was turned over to the states, and the states were given what were called block grants, that is, large amounts of money, or whatever, a certain amount, a large amount of money, that the states were to Imp, uh, to use for their public assistance programs, but the states were able to design their own programs more or less uh, within some uh, boundaries that were set by the federal government. By but by and large, the states had quite a bit of um, leeway in, dis in in designing the kind of programs that they administered. Of course, the benefits uh, levels that were were offered to recipients and so on. And so so really, we have uh, 51 separate safety nets, as this chapter says, instead of this integrated system of income maintenance programs around the nation. Uh, Richard Nixon in 1972, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, but Nixon suggested um, uh, a guaranteed national income that would that would uh, you know, be a bottom floor or whatever to uh, to to ensure that all Americans had at least a minimum amount of money to get by on, but uh, Congress did not approve that during his administration. And uh, the perception that the public has about public assistance programs um, kind of suggests that they believe that they're they're really draining our economy, and it's these public assistance programs and these needy people are the reasons that our budget our nation is having the budgetary problems they have. Whereas the fact is that that um, the amount of of um, money that is taken out of the federal budget in comparison to our social insurance programs is really very minimal. But nonetheless. You know, public the public believes what the public wants to believe, and uh, you can be assured that the uh, politicians pander to those belief systems, as as you often hear in the news, is sometimes very infuriating attitudes and uh, program proposals and uh, proposed by many many of uh, representatives about needy needy uh, individuals and the programs that help support them. So this uh, particular aspect of, of our programming is steeped in a residual perspective, as I said, and it's really designed to ensure that the beneficiaries of this program receive only the absolute minimum necessary resources to get by and, and is really just not enough to lift them out of poverty at all. Now, this, the text points to four major public assistance programs in our nation. Uh, some of these were actually um, touched on in the social insurance programs, but I also mentioned in, in the one slide detailing those programs that these are the programs of the Social Security Act, in fact, that uh, they were not considered social insurance programs. And the Supplemental Security Income uh, Program actually has grew out of the Social Security Act through a number of different amendments to that act. 
um, uh, but but it's not really a part of the social insurance program. It is is more public assistance. So you have the TANF program, the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, which is our welfare program. Although the way it's employed these days, you may as well refer to it as workfare. Uh, these are time limited benefits, and there's very strict uh, requirements in terms of a number of different things that we'll touch on that that uh, recipients have to do in order to remain eligible. In Alaska, this is the Alaska. Temporary Assistance Program, or ATAP. There is the Supplemental Security Income Program, SSI, which provides cash assistance for uh, the poor who are elderly or disabled, and both adults and children. Uh, again, we'll, we'll clarify this some uh, in a few slides from now. The General Assistance Program, which is run by state or local governments for the most part, uh, providing only basic benefits on a very short-term basis and only for low-income persons who can't receive uh, any kind of federal public assistance. And, and really, the um, availability of general assistance programs is, is very minimal indeed. And, and I'm, I'm really almost surprised that it's, it's mentioned here, but uh, it is a program that's out there. And finally, the SNAP program, uh, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, which we know of or have known of as food stamps, which provides benefits to low-income households for food assistance. Now, there are certain assumptions in the public's mind about, about public assistance and that I want to t uh, touch on here. The authors actually identify them, and, and I think uh, very accurately, the kinds of underlying beliefs that uh, the public has about these programs. And, 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 you know, the interesting thing is, is these beliefs really can be traced back to the Elizabethan poor laws of the early 1600s. So we're really talking about about beliefs that are traced back 400 some years to Europe and uh, an entirely different time. One, one of those assumptions is that uh, benefits, if they were generous in, in uh, pu public assistance, they would create a disincentive to work. And so you always have to keep these cash benefits at, at uh, well, really below minimum wage standards in order for the program not to encourage people to, to go on. This, this is the notion, basically, that uh, you know, human beings are lazy, I guess, and, and won't work if, unless they have to. Um, and another assumption is that recipients of welfare must be prodded to work because they, they themselves have no innate motivation. That's why they're on welfare. Uh, the idea, the notion is that work is the best anti-poverty program. And, and uh, I would add to that that uh, education is the best anti-poverty program. Um, solution. Uh, this is the, the kind of solution that is always proposed when, when the question comes up, what do we do about poverty? And you hear all sorts of things about, well, more education, you know, and get people trained better. But the fact is, is that all the education in the world won't help if people, if the jobs aren't out there, if the economy doesn't support those jobs. Forgive me if I've said that before. I'm sure I have a couple of times. Um, the also an assumption is that you have to stigmatize the recip the reception the receiving of public assistance so that people will try to avoid turning to it you know this last resort and in fact that stigma oftentimes uh, prevents people from applying for benefits that that um, really need those benefits and, and also uh, an assumption about women that those women who receive assistance should have to work and not stay at home to take care of their kids, that their children shouldn't have the benefit of being raised by a stay-at-home parent. If you want to do that, I guess you got to take care of your yourself. There are myths uh, that the te text touches on also. I want to kind of run through them a little bit here. That because these are the kinds of things when you when you're in discussions with people about public assistance, you're going to hear these kinds of things come up, and it's helpful to know a little bit about the facts. And, and of course, the text goes into them in much more detail than these slides. But uh, just to so that you know that these these myths are out there, and that there there um, there are some facts to discount these myths. The first one being that many families on assistance have an able-bodied father who refuses to work. And in fact, most of these households are headed by mothers who are unmarried, uh, divorced, widowed, or separated. I'm going to fix this right now. Okay. Um, so th there, there aren't men hiding in closets or anything like that in these public assistance homes, but a lot of people actually think that's true. Um, 
there, there's a myth that that if you're poor, you're probably on public assistance, and that more and more people are getting on assistance all every day. When the fact is that only 14% of families that live below the poverty line in 2014 received TANF benefits. That's like one in seven families that live below the poverty line receive these benefits. There's a myth that mothers keep having babies so they can get more benefits. And so these public assistance families are large and they're growing all of the time. And uh, boy, is that, is, that is certainly an image that, that uh, a lot of people have about this. And the fact is, is that the average side of a TANF family is one child. And, and uh, the text goes into this a little more, but I think the largest percentage of families that receive TANF benefits have only one child. And in fact, uh, there are some states out there that, that uh, deny benefits to any child born um, if, if the uh, parent is an active recipient of, of TANF benefits and, and she gives birth that that child is, is denied, uh, you know, they, they won't add the child to the grant. Um, a myth, once on welfare, always on welfare. This has really never been the case. Uh, a low percentage of persons who receive benefits return after a period of employment. Uh, and and kind of connected to this, the idea that welfare creates intergenerational dependency. But even before the implementation of the TANF program, back in the AFDC days when there were not uh, these uh, time limits on receiving benefits, uh, most recipients were on assistance for less than four years. Most people turn to these benefits only on a temporary basis. Most welfare recipients are black or Hispanic. That's also the belief that minorities are the ones that are crowding these, these uh, welfare roles, when in fact, whites constitute 61% of the recipient pool. Um, uh, there's a belief that assistance provides this disincentive to work that kind of similar to the assumption uh, that those who receive benefits are lazy or don't want to work. And in fact, uh, only 25% of the recipients were not in the labor pool in, in 2012 at all. So that means that three out of four people were, were unemployed and seeking work or were working part-time. If you're working full-time, you're probably not going to qualify for public assistance. Oh, benefits are better than ever. And, and simply not true. TANF benefits have not kept uh, pace with inflation since I don't know that there have even been any cost of living increases nationally, at least, uh, as far as the program goes. And, and again, you know, each state kind of sets their own benefit levels, but many states have actually lowered benefits since the implementation of this program in the mid-90s. Most recipients are never married teen mothers. The fact is, is that uh, teen mothers make up less than 5% of the TANF caseload. One in, less than 1 in 20 recipients are te uh, teenage, never married teenage mothers. There was a lot of concern about that, 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 uh, that AFTC was encouraging uh, uh, girls to get pregnant so that they could get a check. And, and you're going to see that reflected in the, some of the philosophies of the, of the uh, welfare reform program. Uh, we'll talk about that in a few slides. Oh, it's so easy to get on public assistance. TANF caseloads have fallen since 1996, um, though uh, those in deep poverty have increased. So even though the caseloads are getting smaller, the number of people in deep poverty have increasing. So it's, it isn't so easy to get on public assistance, apparently. Oh, beneficiaries move to states where there are higher benefits. And while some beneficiaries do move to other states with higher benefits, what we find is the studies are indicating that they're moving to other states just like the working uh, population does. They go there where the wages are better, where there's better jobs, there's a better economy. Welfare spending consumes a large portion of state spending, and that's that's not true. It's really a very modest part of the budget in most of the states, uh, actually all of the states, I'm sure. Um, TANF benefits encourage women to head their own household, get divorced, have children out of wedlock, and so on. Um, most of you, if, if not all of you, uh, may not know about the 1992 presidential campaign and when George H.W. Bush and his, his vice president, Dan Quayle, um, were campaigning. That's the year that Bill Clinton and Al Gore were elected. And Dan Quayle made a, an icon out of Murphy Brown, a, the television character with, uh, by Candace Bergen, uh, because uh, Murphy made the decision in that show to have a baby. And uh, I don't, I, if I remember correctly, she never even identified who the father was. You know, she just was going to raise this child on her own. And Dan Quayle railed about the 
the uh, assault on family values that that uh, the the media was participating in with uh, with this character Murphy Brown ha doing this and like again you know this is around the time a few years later when when this program was implemented and you're going to see some real flavors of, of morality and in, in the um, in the philosophies of the, of the uh, welfare reform package finally the notion that uh, TANF mothers just simply refuse to work and in fact only 45 percent of the families less than half the families have one unemployed adult um, 38 percent of the grants are child only grants so that the adult isn't even in the grant that, that, that the grant is only being received for the child and there are a number of reasons why that might be the case We've gone over the history of public assistance before. I, I just I'm devoting just one slide to this. So, so just to walk you back through this one more time. Um, the, of course, the aid to dependent children (ADC) was the part of the Social Security Act in 1935. It was intended to, um, you know, to provide mothers with assistance. Uh, I think to be able to stay home with their children. In fact, at least that was the original intent. But that program was moved, uh, became a labor issue. I think it was actually moved to be administered by the Department of Labor at one time so that the working mother became, or the non-working mother became the focus of this grant rather than dependent children that needed the assistance. Um, in, in the early 1950s, the caretaker was added to the grant, which only further fueled this this perception of the, you know, lazy, lazy uh, recipient. Um, and, and then uh, 10 years later, or so they changed the name to Aid to Families with Dependent Children to reflect AFDC to reflect that, you know, that w this was really about the whole family. And there were some very peculiar kinds of, of uh, things. If you ever get a hold of old welfare records, you know, and, and these things still do exist, um, it, it's pretty fascinating to read these things. You know, there was the man in the house rule that, uh, you know, if there was a man who was living there, then, then uh, oftentimes the woman would then be declared ineligible for benefits because the assumption was that the man would be contributing to her, her um, you know, her family's well-being uh, through money and things like that. Um, and they would there would be these things called midnight raids where the social workers actually would just knock on the door in the middle of the night and, and uh you know, look to see who's there and they go through closets and if they so much as found a, you know, a pair of men's shoes or a cigarette butt that, you know, wasn't the kind of cigarettes that the mother smoked or anything like that. Once again, you know, they could declare these, uh, these women unfit and, and, and end their, un, end their grant. And mind you, in these days, these caseworkers were also the people who were making decisions about whether or not a parent was fit to raise their kids. So there wasn't, we didn't have child protection yet. The child protection statutes weren't implemented until the, I think the 1960s or early 70s maybe in, in, um, in most states. And so, so really the AFTC worker was the social worker. And not only did they make decisions about whether or not the mother could get um, money to care for the kids, but they were the ones making the decision about whether moms were living morally and were fit to raise their kids. And and uh, oftentimes children were removed because, you know, they may have found some evidence of a man in the home. The way the AFTC, I worked in the AFTC program when I was fresh out of college, you know, and, and the way the, the uh, program was set up, you, uh, if you had earned income, a certain percentage of that earned income would be forgiven. Uh, I think they called them set asides, and and uh, and and so earned income didn't reduce your grant as much, like dollar for dollar. But if you had any unearned income, which was somebody helping you out, for instance your grant is supposed to be reduced dollar for dollar. So if there was a guy in the home who, you know, was buying food or giving you money to put shoes in the, you know, on the feet of your kids, he gave you a hundred bucks. That's your grant was supposed to be reduced by a hundred dollars that month. And, and, and mind you, I, I know, uh, I remember some situations where moms were, you know, lost their grants because, you know, they didn't report it. And in fact, you know, the, the uh, grant, uh, the grant amount was designed to not be enough to meet your needs. They would call a percentage of need. And I think in Florida, when I worked in the AFTC program in Florida, I think there was a lot of uh, excitement about the fact that they had raised the grant level from 68% to 74% of need. Now that, that isn't even the poverty line. This is talking about what you need in order to live. 
okay? And and the F- Florida was proud because they were giving people, a family, three quarters of what they needed to live. But in a system where if anybody helped you out, that money was taken away from you dollar for dollar, you know? And part of the certification process was uh, to, to see how it is that people were 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 uh, making ends meet, knowing very well that they couldn't possibly make ends meet if that was the only income they had. So certifying somebody for AFTC in those days really was a kind of an investigation to find out where else the money was coming from. And, if, you know, if, as a worker, if you didn't find that, you know, your your uh, supervisor, your casework supervisor could be very critical and would sometimes send, send your certifications back when they reviewed it and tell you to get back to that person and, and drill down more. The, the objective really was to dig out uh, fraud and to cut uh, cut down the amount of money that people were receiving. And it was, these were people who were living in absolute poverty, absolute poverty in Central Florida at the time. It was just a, it was a very difficult job uh, in, in so many respects. And, and, and um, how to go about that job as, as a social worker with social work principles was something that was very difficult. Um, well, and so in any event, I, you know, by the time I got there, they weren't doing midnight raids anymore. And, and I'm happy to say that I'd never had to do that. But I think the California, uh, NASW in California, I think, or public assistance organization, even as late as the 90s, I think, sued the state for being for requiring uh, workers to to do the midnight raids with public assistance uh in public assistance families and, and won that lawsuit. So it was, it was declared that it was unconstitutional, I guess. Um, the the f- focus in the 60s shifted from assistance to rehabilitation. And so casework and treatment services became mandated for many families. Um, in 1968, the Supreme Court uh, struck down the man of the house rule in Alabama. And I think that wound up being applied nationally. In, in the early 70s, uh, payments and services under the Social Security Act were separated. And so um, th- these uh, soft-hearted social workers, such as myself, who were payments workers, were no longer providing services for people. So payments workers are supposed to just look at eligibility and not tend to, if they came across a need, uh, say the family needed a new refrigerator or the kids didn't have any shoes or whatever it might be, we weren't able to address that in our role. We were to send the client down the hall to the service worker who would take care of those things. And so so payments and services were separated. And again, the notion was for payments was uh, really, you know, when the regional manager came out to our office, it was all about reducing the fraud rate. It wasn't about helping our clients. In, in 1988, uh, this was actually during the George H.W. Bush administration, um, the Family Support Act was implemented that, uh, that established mandatory work and training programs. Now, there were, there were work requirements in these programs before, but uh, I, I think it became more um, fleshed out, let's say, with the uh, Family, Service, uh, Family Support Act. Um, and the jobs program, the job opportunity and basic skills program uh, was added. And the interesting thing, I had some students in my social work class, in fact, who were getting credit for attending class as, as a part of their work and, and training requirement. And so the jobs, the jobs program, at least in Alaska, allowed people to, to uh, attend university classes, which is, you know, um, it didn't pay for the class, okay? Uh, you know, they'd have to pay for it in some other way, but, but it credited those hours in the classroom uh, towards the, the training requirement. And you know, some hints of actually giving uh, uh, welfare recipients an opportunity to pull themselves up and move into, uh, you know, primary job market positions. It didn't last for long, but they had it there for a while. Also, there was a focus began to be put on child support payments and absent parents were, the law was set up so that absent parents could have their mandatory child support payments deducted from their paychecks. Um, throughout the existence of the programs from the 50s, uh, when the caretaker was added to the grant, through uh, the early 90s, when the big uh, swell of support for welfare reform began publicly, um, at its height, 5% of the United States population in 1992 were, were recipients. So one in 20 people were receiving uh, AFTC benefits, according to, according to this uh, information that we have in our text. So Bill Clinton's first presidential campaign in 1992 promised to end welfare as we know it. But as the text point out, 
he wound up uh, getting um, a more of this bargain than he than he really wanted. You know, he he was a, a progressive, although he was uh, a master politician. And and during the course of his administration, as has most of the um, politicians, presidents that we've had, they really move towards the center because they they're supposed to try to get support of the left and the right, and and they do that by going to the center. Now you don't see that so much lately, but that's. Uh, that's what has made government work. And so Clinton, uh, Clinton certainly moved towards the center, but he started out with some progressive ideas, national health care, like we talked about uh, a few weeks ago, and, and welfare reform. But he had uh, some uh, kinder kinds of ideas in mind, I believe. But the uh, midterm elections in 1994 swept in a Republican Congress. Newt Gingrich was the Speaker of the House and was just brutal with his ideas about about welfare dependency. You know, his proposal was rather than giving um, women who weren't, weren't working money to keep their kids, let's just take those kids from them and put them in orphanages. You know, now, aside from the absolute stupidity of such a, uh, you know, insensitivity of such a proposal, um, and mind you, he's he's a history professor. He, I mean, he's you know he's not dumb. Um, but, but aside from all of that, I mean, you know, it, it, simple dollars and cents. It's much, much, much more economical to provide for children in their own homes than it is to have them in some sort of care out of home. Aside from the fact that it's much better for them emotionally. So in 1996, largely with the pressure of, of this Republican Congress, Bill Clinton signed the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Act. I'm never going to try to say that, uh, uh, pronounce that acronym. And maybe, maybe it is because it's the program that shall not be named. I don't know. But, uh, but this um, welfare reform program transferred, um, uh, once again, transferred more of the control of, of uh, public assistance to the states. And uh, one of the things it did was establish a lifetime limit um, across, uh, across the United States for adults on grants. And so public assistance, whereas under AFTC, once you qualified, if you were eligible, you had a right to continue to receive that, uh, no longer was considered an entitlement and now you had to you know you had to look at getting it only for a little while and then getting off of it and that that is the residual perspective right there so the goals of this program the welfare reform uh, TANF temporary assistance for needy families was um, were fourfold and one was to provide funds for low-income families so that the children could be looked at after in their own homes or the homes of relatives relatives are eligible to receive aunts and uncles are eligible to receive TANF funds um, to uh, in for the children now not for themselves but for the children if they're caring for um, uh, you know, a nephew or a niece or a grandchild or something like that, they can receive a TANF check for that. Um, many relatives uh, will all, will consider getting licensed as foster parents in Alaska, at least you can do that. I think that's true in most states. You'll get a higher amount of money, but you got a lot more hassle to go through when you're licensed as a foster parent. But uh, but anyway, the relative, uh, they used to call it relative AFTC, I guess is relative TANF now, uh, is available for these families. So one, to provide families to keep children in homes. Secondly, to provide self-sufficiency and end welfare dependency through job pressure, preparation, work, and marriage. Now there we begin to see some of the the moral undertones of this of this program. Work, for one thing, and marriage. And once again, the answer to poverty in this program, this is that assumption, is jobs, jobs, jobs. We're not looking at the, at the economic system at all. We're looking at getting people to work. Um, another stated goal was to reduce uh, out-of-wedlock pregnancies and uh, that's sort of the Murphy-Brown effect, I suspect, there. And, and it also to encourage the growth and maintenance of two-parent families. So you see there... I, and there are some studies that, that do, I mean, in defense, that show that, you know, children raised in two-parent families have a lot of advantages, you know, that, that children in one-parent families don't have. But, but nonetheless, you still get the, the moral uh, imperatives in, in, in this program. It wasn't just about economics. It was also about changing the perceived behaviors, the perceived behaviors of welfare recipients. 
hmm, okay, somewhere along the line, my recording program stopped working, and I, I wasn't aware of it, so hopefully um, I'm not repeating things. I think I know where it left off. Also, I just want to point out to you, in case you haven't noticed, I have a head cold, and it might even be the flu. After our trip uh, east, uh, most of my family wound up with, with serious, serious cases of the flu, and I've, I've kind of dodged that bullet terribly, but uh, today I'm not doing so well, so forgive the um, if, if there's more sniffing and nasal stuff than usual. Okay, anyway, picking up where I think we left off, uh, which would be the provisions, uh, and, and this isn't all of them, but some of the major provisions of this, uh, of this uh, act include that uh, the adult can't receive assistance for more than 60 months total in a lifetime. Uh, now, the states were given the opportunity to, to implement hardship provisions so that 20% of their caseload could be exempted from, from this requirement. The fact is, is there are people who are just never going to be employable for a variety of reasons. Also, children, um, the, the five-year limit didn't apply to children in the grant. So if the adult had to come out of the grant, it would reduce the grant, but children may still continue to be recipients. Um, the states were able to implement tougher time limits, and some of them did. Um, Alaska had a, uh, a two-year at any one time so that you could only draw TANF benefits for two years at a stretch, uh, and then you had to come off the program. I don't know if that's the – I don't see that anywhere in the text, and I, I should have checked this out before I, before I did this recording, but I don't know if that was a national requirement or if it was strictly Alaska, but that might be an example of – of uh, you know some of the manipulation the states can do with the time limits. Um, if there's a minor in the home, the children have to stay in school and be living with their parent in order to be recipients. This includes teen parents, and if uh, uh, or they had to be living in a home approved an adult supervised arrangement. Um, the grantee, uh, that is the the parent raising the children had to cooperate in identifying the father and locating the absent parent. And, you know, as we've talked about in other lectures, there's a lot of reasons why they might want to not, not want to do that. And, you know, in domestic violence situations where they're trying to stay out of touch or they don't want to stir things up with the, with that, with that guy because he was abusive or, you know, there may be some concerns about him kidnapping the children or things like that. But, but if the woman um, in this grant, the recipient didn't cooperate, with with uh, with this, she would become ineligible. Um, work requirements of 30 hours a week, uh, 20 hours, I think, if it's a child under three. And also the states were given financial incentives for reducing their caseloads, their TANF caseloads, and also for reducing the out-of-wedlock birth rates and, and lowering their abortion rates in the state. So, again, you see how all this is tied together. I believe the Denali Kid Care program, some of the funds at least that, that uh, funded the Medicaid expansion in uh, Alaska, the state part of it at least, came from, from, uh, from the savings that were found in the TANF um, implementation in Alaska. So, boldface, the welfare reform prohibits the states from using federal TANF dollars to assist most legal immigrants until they have been in the United States for five or more years. Legal immigrants aren't eligible. Uh, some states can use funds to assist recent, uh, recent immigrants, uh, people who have just got refugees and such, you know, but, but uh, most of the states don't do that. And again, in red boldface here, neither federal nor state TANF funds can go towards the support of undocumented immigrants. And you always hear about this and how immigrants are taking up all of our benefits and this kind of thing, not the case. Now, in the first few years of implementation of this program, welfare caseloads saw dramatic decreases, some 50 or 60 percent. But, but there were some other things going on in the economy at the time, including the fact that there was a very strong labor, labor market and a booming economy in the 90s during the Clinton administration. I mean, when Clinton left office, there was actually a budgetary surplus, not a deficit, but a surplus, that which was quickly eliminated by the next administration. But but uh, there were good economic times in the 90s, and so it was a little easier to get people off of, off of uh, welfare caseloads and out into the job market than it was, you know, would be at other times. And as the authors point out, you know, the real test was what happened after the recession in 2008, and 
what happened is the poverty rate has increased and the TANF caseloads continue to decrease. So people aren't turning to this program or aren't able to turn to the program. They're leaving TANF for secondary labor market jobs that, that hardly provide minimum wage. Many have no private health insurance, and that's one reason why a lot of women prefer to stay on TANF if they can, because for their children in particular to have health coverage. About a quarter of, of families living below the poverty level received TANF benefits in 2013, only about a quarter. And the benefits are currently below 50% of poverty level in all states and as low as 20% or below in some of those states. There's also some discussion about what happened with the teen pregnancy rate because of all that focus and in the welfare reform thing about that. And in fact, I think there was initially some reduction, but generally speaking, you know, the teen pregnancy rate has fallen in the United States. That may be because of other things. And, you know, the big focus was upon abstinence only. That was a lot of the funding for reducing uh, teen pregnancy. Again, that moralistic kind of uh, approach. And what they found is a lot of the people that are, young people that are in the abstinence only program um, don't don't really access contraceptives. And, and uh, so it kind of works, you know, works uh, the opposite of what it's supposed to. That's one of those unintended consequences to policy that, uh, you know, that we talked about previously. You know, if you're not going to have sex, if you're not allowed to have sex, then you don't want to carry condoms or, or worry about birth control pills. On to the SSI program it began, as I mentioned earlier, in the Nixon administration with the Social Security Act revisions. Remember that the Social Security Act in 1935 provided assistance to the states to care for the aged, blind, and disabled who were destitute in their in their states, and um, states particularly in the South, but elsewhere also. Some states provided very, very uh, bare bones checks. I mean, it wasn't enough to live on and other states were a little more generous with that. But uh, Nixon, that's why Nixon wanted this guaranteed uh, national income, which Congress didn't approve. But what they did do was uh, federalize the, the, um, the state categorical assistance programs, the assistance to the aged, blind, disabled, and turned this into SSI so that there was a consistent level of benefit across the United States. Now, that doesn't take into account uh, uh, cost of living in different areas, but, but nonetheless. Um, this is needs-based, so it's, it's not a part of the social insurance program, even though it grew out of the Social Security Act. Um, and it has grown very rapidly since its inception, largely because of the fact that there are a lot of uh, disabled uh, persons being approved for, for benefits. These are people who haven't worked in the Social Security system the requisite 40 quarters um, you know, contributed to Social Security for 40 quarters and a substantial amount of income um, so that they're disabled but haven't worked long enough to qualify for Social Security disability. So SSI disability is, is needs-based. And um, it, it, I think Social Security disability is probably hard enough to get, but SSI disability may be even more difficult. Um, unlike public assistance uh, or TANF funds, the base benefit for SSI is adjusted annually for inflation, just like the Social Security uh, funds are. In 1990, uh, Sullivan versus Zebley, the Supreme Court ruled that children with a disability were entitled to the same benefits as any adult with that same condition. Um, so what we have now are children receiving benefits, and I think this has a lot to do with the increase in uh, in the caseloads of SSI, you know, that uh, children who aren't responsible for supporting others now are receiving these benefits because they have a disability. And I'm not sure that's the, in the original intention, but that's that's what is. Uh, most recipients in SSI have some sort of disability. It says here about 60% of those uh, still of working age uh, have a mental disorder. And, and, and if an adult going into residential treatment for alcoholism or drug addiction also, I think, just temporarily is required or is eligible for uh, SSI, I think this is as much to help fund treatment as anything, perhaps. But the benefits really are not doing much uh, to, to alleviate poverty. It's uh, still, the recipients still are only at 75% of the poverty level. I think it's a little higher than TANF. It's higher than TANF because, partly because of the fact that it's indexed for inflation. Again, boldface, 
most immigrants are ineligible, with the exception of uh, those uh, who arrived here before 1996. Those who, uh, refugees who come here can be at benefits temporarily, and those legal immigrants after 1996 who have earned eligibility for Social Security coverage, working the required 40 quarters with substantial earnings. Um, apparently not eligible for Social Security disability, I, I gather, because they're, uh, I don't know why, maybe because they're not citizens, but they are they are eligible for SSI. So there's one exception to to the uh, immigrants. But again, these are legal immigrants. Eligibility requirements are stringent. There's a lot of red tape, and and um, there are, there are beliefs out there that this is intentional. That really, what the government is trying to do is to screen out applicants as much as possible. Um, and and especially if you're applying for SSI disability, you can figure on going two or three times before you're going to be approved. I mean, it's almost a joke that you never get approved for SSI disability, maybe even Social Security disability the first time around. And it's so bad that that uh, many applicants are we're hiring attorneys on a, on a contingency fee basis to help them with this with this uh, qualification. General assistance, you know, I. Um, I, I virtually non-existent as far as I know. I mean, this is really kind of basic, basic uh, provision, you know, like you, somebody needs help getting their lights turned on, their food's going to, you know, spoil or whatever. I, I, you know, I mean, it's that kind of thing that I remember. Uh, Orange County, Florida had a general assistance uh, program. I don't know if they still do or not, but this, I think the, uh, the text says only 11 states provide general assistance to adults without a disability. Uh, and that only 26 states have any kind of general assistance program at all, so about half the states. But in many of them, you have to be disabled in order to qualify, and you can't be eligible for any kind of federal federal help, apparently. If you're childless as an adult and you're poor and you're not disabled, you, you will not find a federal program to assist you. These, these individuals were left to the states to be concerned about, and most states don't worry about them. Interestingly, the text, although it mentions SNAP as one of the four uh, public assistance programs, it doesn't even talk about the, the program at all in the book. I don't understand that. So I went to the web and I pulled off a couple of slides. Uh, this is from feedingamerica.org. It says that, you know, the SNAP program is a federal program that helps millions of low-income Americans put food on the table. Uh, 9.5 million families with, ch with children are on the SNAP program. It's the largest program working to fight hunger in America. Um, th this program provides families with basic nutritional needs to get them through temporary hard times. It helps people get back up on their feet. Um, it is not a permanent assistance program. Uh, you have to qualify for this. And again, the, the requirements, the qualifications are pretty stringent and you have to constantly uh, get recertified. Uh, my first program, my first job rather, coming out of college was a food stamp certification program. I worked there for six months before I, I got promoted to pub the public assistance program. But uh, boy, we were uh, we were doing uh, uh, 15 interviews a day, half hour each. So that meant that we had a one half hour where we didn't do interviews. I guess we we're supposed to do our paperwork during that time. I don't know, but. Boy, did uh, we see destitute people. This was in the, uh, during a period of, in the mid-1970s of a recession. There were people in just terribly dire straits. Um, now, this program is a, is a program of the United States Department of Agriculture. It's not an HEW program. It's administered by USDA. And one of the things that tells you is, is that it, it is designed to help farmers. Okay, as much as it is perhaps more than it is to des to help the needy. So there used to be a, the commodities program, you know, where they would hand out cans of peanut butter and cans of this and cans of that. And they stopped that and they replaced it with the food stamp program, I think somewhere in the late 50s, early 60s. Um, and in the old program, you had to... Uh, depending upon how you qualified for this when I was working there, uh, you might have to come up with some cash in order to get your food stamps. So depending upon your benefit level, uh, if you were, I don't know, a family of two might qualify for $144 of food stamps in a month. I think that was actually a family of three. It's not much. Now, this was in the 70s, but still, it still wasn't much. 
but depending if you had some income, you know, you might have to pay 20 bucks to get your $144 of food stamps. So if you didn't have any money, you're really pretty much out of luck. And and um, there were a lot of problems. I think they did away with that cash purchase requirement and they just reduced the amount of food stamps you got. Um, but putting money or putting food stamps, putting snap cards, whatever you want to call it, in the hands of, of the needy contributes to the economy it it food is purchased that helps the farmers it helps uh, people who work in the grocery stores you know uh, all those individuals associated with the food industry and it says here that uh, every dollar spent by snap uh, brings 1.7 dollars back to the economy and uh, a study about uh, in 2010 by the usda found that for every 1 billion of added snap funding uh Somewhere between 9,000 and 17,000 jobs are created, but when uh, a billion is, is taken in cuts, uh, about 11,400 jobs would be destroyed. So that's something to think about. You know, the, the, our attitude about recipients sometimes gets in the way of looking at good financial sense of these programs. Uh, I already mentioned that. And here, here this, this actually comes from the USDA website. And, and, um, it tells you, you know, who qualifies for SNAP benefits. Those are low-wage workers, unemployed. Those receiving welfare uh, generally are, TANF recipients are generally automatically eligible for SNAP benefits, I believe. Um, the elderly are disabled and that have little income and the homeless. Um, persons uh, uh, who are on strike are not eligible for uh, SNAP benefits because they're on strike. And, and the amount you get, as I mentioned earlier, is, is, well, first of all, it's based on the Department of Agriculture's Thrifty Food Plan. And it's a basic, um, you know, nutrition formula or whatever for food and things like this. And so uh, low cost meals, you know, I know that the image is, you know, these food stamp people are getting steaks and buying cigarettes and Rare, rarely true. They're not buying cigarettes with their benefits, uh, and and if they're getting steaks, so you can believe that it's it's uh, a rarity. And and um, anyway, I often wonder what it is that makes people look in other people's shopping. Do do you look in other people's shopping baskets in the grocery store? I don't. And even when I'm standing in line, I, I have no interest in what other people are buying. I only wonder about how much I'm going to spend. Uh, but but some people like to look in other people's shopping carts. I don't know what motivates that. Um, one interesting thing here about, about this program that is different from, from TANF, for instance, and other programs is that this is, you talk about a household, and, and so individuals living in a house together who prepare their meals together and buy their meals together, so they don't have separate, like, you know, this is Joe's shelf, and this is Annie's shelf, and this is Freddie's shelf, but they actually combine their foods, and they cook together and everything. That's considered a household for SNAP, and so all three incomes can be considered, or lacks of incomes can be considered and they would get food stamp benefits for a household of three, even though they're not related. Um, so it depends on the number of people in your household and, and how much monthly income is left after. And there are certain expenses, uh, and without going into eligibility, I mean, that are, that are deducted. So, um, and, and as I mentioned here, you know, this isn't on the USDA website, but the Trump administration recently is... Uh, you know, trying to undermine, uh, well, the public attitude about food stamp recipients and trying to, you know, the states are beginning to implement work requirements and these kinds of things, you know, and most of the people that are receiving food stamps are already working, actually. It's an interesting thing. So, so just a couple of slides here to kind of tie this all together. Welfare reform transformed, uh, the authors say, uh, our public assistance policy into a labor policy clothed in welfare terminology. So at the height of its its implementation in 95, AFDC and food stamps accounted for only 3% of the federal, <laughs> federal budget outgo, 3%. Um, and so it really wasn't so much about um, how much it costs as it is that the the fact that there there was such a large number of people uh, still relying upon assistance from the government that 
that showed that the marketplace isn't meeting the needs of Americans, despite the fact that the philosophy of capitalism is that we all can succeed. Since welfare reform, the only option for adults uh, who have exhausted their five years is work or destitution. And um, if there are jobs out there, then this is a labor market issue, not, not a welfare problem as far as this new philosophy is concerned. Um, and as mentioned here, and it will be mentioned again, you know, secondary labor market uh, is, is actually more uncertain than living on TANF itself. Low wage employers are rewarded, um, the authors tell us, through the tax ins uh, assistance programs like the earned income tax credit, the child tax credit, SNAP, Medicaid, those things, which are benefits that the government provides that makes up for the shortfall between the salaries they're paying their workers and the actual cost of living. You know, think about that. It is, it is again, uh, employers benefit from this program. Um, and, and so, in the meantime, the workers are the ones who are punished by being forced into poorly paid jobs with no future and little, if any, benefits at all. And there, there are those, and I made reference to this group a little earlier, sub, people who have substance abuse issues, uh, some persons with physical disabilities, victims of domestic violence who, you know, have a hard time um, perhaps showing up regularly at work and staying in a single location those kinds of things, people with mental health issues, those with learning disabilities, language problems, chronic health issues. These are individuals that may not, no matter what kind of programs you implement, you know, may not really ever be employable. Some of them, a certain percentage of them. And these individuals aren't going to fare well in the labor market. And so, so really our, our uh, programs really ignore those individuals, hopefully at least, those are among the 20% that the states can exempt from the five-year rule. That is, if they qualify for TANF. Getting women off of welfare has been a success. The TANF caseloads have been reduced dramatically, but lifting women out of poverty is something entirely different from that and has not been successful. The authors say welfare reform that offers the welfare poor an opportunity to become the working poor is no real reform at all. The challenge that remains is to divide policies that will accelerate the upward mobility of welfare families so that they can partake in the American dream. But as, as uh, I like this, the authors point out reasons why that's probably never going to happen. And first of all, people, uh, if, if welfare beneficiaries come off and get primary market, you know, primary uh, job market jobs where they can really get ahead, um, that uh, kind of leaves the working poor not on welfare in the, in the, you know, in the dust. And so, so the idea that the welfare uh, beneficiaries should obtain benefits that working poor don't is, is one thing that, you know, um, troubles a lot of people. Um, and politically, it's a hazard for politicians to support welfare recipients over the working poor. So these kind of things may not change with our current system. So welfare reform will only focus on lifting the poor up to the level of the working poor. And uh, the program itself has become a feeder system to supply the secondary labor market with manpower that is allowing employers to pay, you know, um, wages below living wage level and, and to get away with it because there are tax programs that incentive programs and assistance programs that will make up the difference. And we blame the recipients. So, you know, as you can see from looking at the, these policies and everything, the welfare reform program was really intended to alter the behaviors of the poor. I refer to as welfare behaviorism in the text. You know, the, the philosophy of the welfare reform program appeals to those traditional American values that we talked about in the first week of individualism, independence, self-reliance, work as a moral behavior. All of these kinds of things really are, are displayed. These American values are displayed in the design of our public assistance programs in this nation. That's all I have for this, and uh, uh, thanks for bearing with me through this, and I hope, I hope you find this information helpful. As always, let me know if there's questions. Thanks.